disillusionment, personal issues, stagflation, unemployment. Oh, brother. This is what shaped Nebraska, a key moment in Bruce Springsteen's career. A contradictory one, too. Nebraska sold more than three times what the music industry gurus had predicted, and less than any of the previous three albums by the boss, or less than Born in the USA, its follow-up. Nebraska gave us the voice that we now know as Springsteen's voice, according to critic David Burke. Yet, the album is hailed as a masterpiece even by people who don't like that voice. Nebraska is a collection of catastrophically lo-fi first takes, released by an artist known for his hard-working perfectionist spirit. Can we explain these contradictions? How did Nebraska come to be? Why does the music still resonate with us 40 years down the line? Let's find out in this episode of If Music Could Talk. Colts Neck, New Jersey, 3rd of January 1982. Bruce Princeton had spent Christmas at home recording demos for his next album. For the first time in his life, Princeton was debt free with some money in the bank, but something didn't add up. He would visit his hometown and feel completely out of touch, alienated. Bruce would see the people still living there, paychecks stretching to keep the hope alive. He found he couldn't reconcile his success with their reality. His newfound financial stability didn't mix with the high unemployment and the high inflation plaguing his neighbors. Unable to fit back in, Bruce found himself rootless, unable to find a place to call his own. Not the best way to spend the festivities. Springsteen tried to kick the blues writing songs, and the songs kept coming. 15 in total in just a few days. The new material touched upon the themes of Born to Run, The River, Factory, and older songs by the boss. This time, though, it felt different. I wanted black bedtime stories. I thought of the records of John Lee Hooker and Robert Johnson, music that sounded so good with the lights out. I wanted the listener to hear my characters think to feel their thoughts, their choices. The songs were bare, sometimes just three chords strung together. Yet, they seemed to have a certain personality. But would they be good enough to be released? Or even just good enough to chase away the ghosts hunting Bruce? Well, yes or no? Hello, Top Potters. This is Simon Mas. A guy who brought a suit on the cheap to feel like Cary Grant, but looks like a fat shaved Borat. Welcome to this episode of If Music Could Talk. Bruce Princeton had never been a good judge of his songs as he was writing them. He needed to record the music, dress it up a little, only then he could understand if a song could stand on its own. In the past, this sometimes had meant wasting thousands of dollars in a studio before walking away to tweak this or that section. A very expensive way to proceed. This new material could lead to even more headaches. Never before Bruce had drawn so much inspiration from old tunes. His manager, John Landau, had pointed him to the Folkways anthology of American folk music. Springsteen devoured the 84-song collection soaking in the late 1920s and early 1930s music. Then there were the mid to late 30s and the 1940s, the Library of Congress folk music recordings. Simple musical structures, simpler life, days gone by. Bruce had started to think about his own childhood, about his gone-by days. It was then that he had started writing. 
It was then that other influences had crept in. I was after a feeling, a tone that felt like the world I'd known and still carried inside me. The remnants of that world were still only 10 minutes and 10 miles from where I was living. My family, Dylan, Woody, Hank, the American Gothic short stories of Flannery O'Connor, the noir novels of James M. Kane, the quiet violence of the films of Terence Malick, and the decayed fable of the Night of the Hunter all guided my imagination. When he had written enough songs for his next album, Springsteen had an idea. He sent Mike Butlin on an errand. Butlin, his guitar technician, was to find the recorder. No, not the instrument, you know, the machine. That's the one. Through that, Bruce could have a recording of the new songs with a bare-bone arrangement. He could save money on studio fees and judge the quality of his work. Batlon came back with a 4-track Japanese Tascam 144 cassette recorder. I mixed the recording through a guitar echoplex unit onto a beat box like the kind you'd take to the beach. Total cost for the project, about a grand. And so it came to pass that Christmas 1981 and the first few days of 1982 were spent setting up the equipment and recording the music. The resulting demos were extremely lo-fi, but they were good enough for Bruce. The new songs had more than a personality, they had a soul. Three chords of fair, simple melodies, but the atmosphere they created was tense. Abstaining from clear moral judgments about the characters populating them, the song still hit you in the face. Time to walk in a studio and give them a proper recording. But when Springsteen did walk in a studio with the E Street Band, something felt wrong. Again. Atlantic City, Mansion on the Hill, Nebraska. They were all tried out with the full band. They all sounded very polished and professional, but they were inferior to the demos, somehow. Bruce tried recording different versions, first without a horn section, then alone. The demos couldn't be beaten. Chuck Plotkin, engineer for the session, said the studio takes were less meaningful, they were less emotionally compelling, they were less honest. After two weeks, the sessions moved to newer material. The band came up with the arrangement for Born in the USA, we all know. Then came Downbound Train. At this point, Springsteen realized he had two albums on hand, one electric, the other acoustic. He tried to reconcile the two. He could produce one double album record, after all, but the acoustic material didn't happen. Nothing matched the intensity of the demo tape. So Bruce reworked Child Bride into Working on the Highway. Then he wrote new electric songs. Born in the USA, the album that broke Bruce Springsteen around the world, started shaping up. Everyone was thrilled, overjoyed. Everyone but Bruce. After a meeting with Landau, Bruce decided that he had to do something with the acoustic material. If nothing could top the demos, why not release the demos? The time is ripe to talk in depth about the actual music. What makes those demos so special? For a start, they sound different. Nocturnal, muffled, the atmosphere is dreamlike. Some, Nebraska, Mansion on the Hill, reasons to believe, sound like lullabies. The material seems recorded from far away as if these were memories of something happened a long time ago. This was the case with Nebraska. The song is an account of a homicide spree that shocked America, one of the many, sadly. It happened between December 1957 and January 1958. Charles Raymond Stark Weather, 19, and Carol Ann Fugate, 14, decided to take a ride, killing people wherever they went. Fugate's mother, 
father and two-year-old sister, her family friends, random teenagers on the road, mates, dogs, industrialists and their wives. You name it, they probably killed it. I bet the song it's not in the playlist of any gun advocate. Some of the time we're dealing with current news. Take Atlantic City. The song backdrop is the organized crime war over the disputed city. It all started in 1976 after the proposal to legalize gambling. The war was still going on when Springsteen set pen to paper, but even here, the world around the main character serves as a mere background. In each of the nine songs that ended up on Nebraska, reality seems to be another dimension. People don't belong there, they don't have a real relationship with each other. It's like mixing oil and water. Alienation, remember? Debts, low pay and unemployment shatter these characters' psyche. Every relationship breaks down in a state of constant precariousness. One can only live for himself, as if everything else was a distant dream, like in State Trooper. But hey, this is the 21st century. It's not like I have to explain all that, right? There are echoes of folk music too. The album's outlaws, though, are not folk song heroes. The closest one get to that here is Johnny 99. No surprise, the song draws from a 1927 folk song, 99 Year Blues, with the layer of complexity laid over it. Johnny 99 kills a man after unemployment and debts leave him no alternative to armed robbery. Johnny himself knows that what he has done is inexcusable. He demands to receive a death penalty rather than 99 years in jail. And yet, the commotion in the courtroom shows that people felt a grave injustice had been committed. We, the listeners, are taking all this in, as if we were the real jury. Hardly your standard folk fair. But the masterpiece of the album is Mansion on the Hill. The mansion is almost a mystical symbol, like a cathedral in a medieval town. Both rise above every other building, but the cathedral was in the middle of the town, while the mansion is physically separated from it. The cathedral was a place open to everyone, rich and poor. People went there to emphasize the old town was a single community. The mansion is a place only open to the rich, a place forbidden to everyone but a chosen few. It serves as a symbol of the divide within the community. A kind of heaven where you can't aspire to go. You can only look up and feel awestruck. And not a pinch of anger throughout the whole song. So yes, this bunch of early take demos with their world-setting problems and their sonic disasters had to be released. But how? It wasn't easy. To understand why, I need to go a bit technical on you. The demos sounded different than any re-recording because they broke every rule of the sound engineer police. First problem. Batlan was learning to set the Tuscan machine as Springsteen was recording. This gave the sound a bit of distortion here and there. You can hear what I'm talking about right now, magnified, of course. Second problem. The very speed knob was initially set to have the tape run faster. When Batlan realized what had happened, he brought the tape back to normal for the mixing stage. You can hear the results. Lower pitch and a further degraded sound quality. Bonus problem! Professional studio tape is 2 inches wide. It is only used on one side. One mono track, one reel of tape. The Tascam recorder used normal cassettes. One eighth of an inch wide tape used on both sides. One tape for four tracks. Let's do some maths here. 
at best a Tascam 144 could produce a recording 128 times worse than a professional studio. This means more noise, less high frequencies, muddier sound recordings. You are hearing an extreme representation of that. Third problem. Remember that the final demo mixes use the beatbox like the kind you take to the beach? The only machine available was an old Panasonic boombox which Springsteen had dropped in a river while canoeing. The machine had been left in the water and mud for hours until retrieved with the change of the tide. Imagine the state of the recording had on that boombox and how it harmed the demos. Fatality! Tascams were not high-profile machines. They had a discrete amount of wow and flutter. This video is already too long as it is. Be content with the extreme oral representation you are hearing now. The master engineers were all so happy to spend a lot of time cleaning the demos for professional release. Five different facilities couldn't cut the master disc. Too much distortion. Too many problems. In the end, a specific EQ setting and an old, less sensitive mastering late at Atlantic Studios did the trick. Nebraska was born. Bruce Springsteen was finally satisfied. But such was the stress of living through the alienation and the birth of the album that he had a mental breakdown. A 2018 article in Esquire revealed he spent some time in analysis. Bruce didn't tour to promote the album. Naturally, this meant lower sales for Nebraska. Still, it sold three or even four times more than the most optimistic industry expert had forecast. Not bad. Not bad at all. If you liked Nebraska, you might want to check out the anthology of American folk music by Folkways, or the complete Hank Williams, or any recording issued on the Yazoo label. It's not the same atmosphere, but if they were good enough for the boss, you might like them too. Another album worth a listen is Bob Dylan's Blood on the Tracks. If you can find a bootleg release of its New York sessions, you will find bliss. Or you can patch the thing together from the outtakes on the bootleg series volume 14. More blood, more tracks. Fancy isolation, alienation and broken relationships in lo-fi? Four track demos by PJ Harvey has all of that mixed with a strong dose of angst. Many British New Wave albums from the early 1980s touched on those themes. I'd go with Soft Cell's non-stop exotic dancing for a danceable beat. You like the dance idea, but you want more politics. Look no further than Fela Kuti, let's say Zombie. You'll love it if you like Adrian Belew's guitar playing or Talking Heads remain in light. Let's go back to the 1980s and the States for more albums on neoliberalism. Check out Damage by Black Flags. Not quite as dreamy as Nebraska, though. Or how about Zappa's Broadway the Hard Way? As usual, you can write in the comments your guess on which of these I'll be covering next. Time to go now. Keep your top hat on and see you soon. My story with Nebraska solves the last contradiction. Why does it fare so well with non-Springsteen fans? Nebraska was created to self-medicate. The way it sounds sets it apart from all the rest of Springsteen's production, but when I first listened to the album, back in 2007, I found more. I'd been watching similar stories unfold ever since I was 10. Beyond the happy, smiling, Puritan, can-do, positive attitude of neoliberal ideologues, there was a bleak truth. 
Nebraska is a political statement transcending the institution Bruce Springsteen has become. He showed us how we would break apart as a society. Back in 1982, it might have been a marginal phenomenon. In 2022, we are all alone, even the 1%. If music could talk, it might say sweetness follows. And you? What's your story with Nebraska? Drop me a line in the comments or on Telegram. The link is in the description. Simon Mas, music you love.